our final for the day, again, in the vein of entertainment and kind of shaking things up. We have Megan Innan. She is a mezzo-soprano um, and a peacemaking specialist. So there she is. So mm -hmm. I'll turn over um, to, I will get out of the way. This is a virtual concert hall. So <laughs> put us over to you, Megan, and let you do your thing and entertain us and everyone else. When Megan is finished, please come back and we'll do the final wrap up after Megan. Sounds good. Thank you, Karen. Hi, as Karen mentioned, my name is Megan Enan. I am a professional mezzo-soprano. I sing classical music and avant-garde experimental music. I work with composers. I am also the incoming executive director of the Live Music Project. And there we are devoted to information, better information to access arts experiences. And I highly encourage you to come over and check us out. We are at livemusicproject.org. I would love to interact with you there. So as Karen also mentioned, I am a placemaking specialist and I will talk about a little bit about that also during this time. So there is a sector of research called creative placemaking and it's one of the things that really lights me up. So with that in mind, creative placemaking is a lot about ideas is about reinforcing community identity through place. And as you can probably imagine, the COVID-19 pandemic with the shutting down of venues threw all of that into flux. And so as someone who is very, very devoted to place into community through place, you can imagine that staying home or not being able to go to our places was something that was really scary and isolating and and threw us into quite a tizzy, right? So when when I was asked to be a part of Eventicon, I, I thought, okay, I would love to talk about, especially the virtual concert hall during COVID-19 and beyond, how we've gone through this time together and what are some of the key learnings that we can take away going forward. And so when we think about how did classical music or how did music nonprofits respond to the shuttering of venues across the United States, first of all, it was mostly panic. This is a this is a kind of business ending or world ending situation for most arts nonprofits that if they cannot serve their community through the programs that they do in person, especially in the music world, this could mean the end of their their ability to operate, which is which is just devastating. And so I can imagine that most of you know artists in your lives, especially if you know musicians, that at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty and fear about their ability to continue in that art form. So like I said, this at the beginning of this pandemic and shuttering of venues, what are we feeling? Panic. And then what are we feeling? I have to do something, right? <laughs> and, so, and so what do you see is, is you see most of these classical music, new music, contemporary music, and and such organizations and ensembles turn to live streaming and broadcasting of their of their performances of their content. So when we're thinking about live streaming, we're thinking about using systems, software systems like OBS, Open Broadcasting, I think is what it's called, OBS and Ecamm Live, and various other ones to stream their content to platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, etc. And you see a bunch of music nonprofits or arts organizations scrambling to suddenly understand how do I bring my content to these platforms in a live stream way. And you're starting to realize that all of a sudden we've got, we're very, very good at being able to get hundreds of people on stage playing together, making these beautiful sounds. And yet the idea of having to make that happen over the internet suddenly becomes very daunting. And so, so we're thinking about what are these systems? What do people use? How do we make sure that the sound comes across in a way that is, is attractive, compelling, pleasing, because there's so much about that. We're having to upgrade our networks, right? We're having to upgrade our bandwidth for things like that, where organizations are not used to having to use that capacity for live streaming. They're used to, oh, well, we use our we use our internet capability for, you know, organizational email. <laughs> like suddenly you're hosting thousands of people watching, you are trying to uh, bring like high, high resolution content through your, your internet. And this is may or may not be working the way that you thought it was going to. 
you have administrators who are attempting to learn learn concepts like CPU, what's the, the availability? Is this working? How do I how do I set up the resolution from my live streaming system or what's on my computer or what's on my cameras to make sure that it's connecting and doing the YouTube resolution the way that I want it to? How do I make sure that I'm not running into buffering issues? This is kind of our, you know, our live streaming 101, right, is making sure that your amazing, gorgeous, beautiful content isn't running into buffering or you're running into any sort of lag because that's not what your community wants to experience through what you're doing. So speaking of that, you also have teachers and universities who are are experimenting with low latency options such as Jack Trip, Soundjack, Jam Kazam, because at the at the beginning of the pandemic, we're also trying to figure out how do we recreate the rehearsal experience or the per- live in-person performance experience. And while this works really well for us to have video conferences, the the very nuanced playing of things together, the simultaneity of having to play music together is very challenging in a latency atmosphere of the internet. So experiencing some of these, using these software systems like Jack Trip, Jam Kazam, helps teachers and students, helps ensemble members work together so that they don't have to be in the same place to be able to rehearse the very fine, nuanced work that they have to create together to get into a performance atmosphere. One of the interesting and unique ways that we've also seen this is that composers, music creators who are working right now, embraced some of the latency issues to make new compositions that worked with that, with that kind of what might have been seen as a barrier. Now they're thinking of that as a creative possibility. And they're saying, okay, well, if I have, if there's latency involved with this, how can I use that to my advantage to create exciting musical moments that won't be disrupted by any latency issues, but they will actually be enhanced by the fact that there is that element of chance involved. I wanted to point out that some organizations and ensembles, symphonies, orchestras, etc., were using their live streaming, their broadcasting to great effect before the pandemic. And they were served so well by investing in that technology early on. So I'm thinking of Detroit Symphony, Frankfurt Radio Symphony. I'm also thinking of Metropolitan Opera had invested early on in high quality video and audio recording and broadcasting capability so that they could use that. And they had gotten comfortable. They had staff that ran that for every single performance. So you're not only getting the content that you can use again because it is recorded, but they were working through the learning curve of streaming and to connect with their communities and their audiences beforehand. So speaking of connecting with that, what are some of the key learnings from this intense exploration of virtual performances? Is exactly what I'm saying here is making sure that you have the best equipment and setup possible. So as musicians, we really need to embrace all of the technology that's available to us at this point in time and going forward so that we can make use of the ability to live stream and broadcast in a way that we've never had access to before. Things that have even in the last year, because of the pandemic, have pushed these capabilities along. While we had access to them before, it will only continue to become more democratized and more available. And it's important for us to embrace those so that we can find out what are the nuances of this technology so that more people can participate. And it doesn't have to be too, uh, it doesn't have to be so expensive to be involved, to be able to broadcast or live stream. So in music, sound, is your medium. So we're really looking for high quality microphones. We're looking for the ability to capture room sound in addition. So many people were experiencing having to finagle their sound settings on Zoom, for example, because Zoom is set up for video conferencing in a, in a speaking capacity. So it, it does a lot of muting of room sound. But when you have music, you want that sound to vibrate more and want it to pick up and last. And so musicians had to go through an entire learning curve of realizing how to set 
settings so that you're actually grasping the sound that you want to have shared and not only defaulting to sounds that are that are set up for for office correspondence, right? Or web conferencing. Another key learning from this, and this is part of my work with Live Music Project, is we run a concert calendar that was Seattle-based at the beginning of the pandemic, was Seattle and Puget Sound performances, in-person performances. With the pandemic raging on, we suddenly realized that everything is canceled across the board. All of our partner organizations are scrambling to figure out how do we present our work. And then we started to get this influx of live stream performances. And we said, well, we need to adapt. We need to adapt our technology to make sure that we can still provide the service that we do to our community, which is to connect them to information about the arts. So we offered all, all anybody who was live streaming. So this is one of the beautiful things about you'll you'll find about our live music project concert calendar is when you come to our concert calendar, you'll see live stream and broadcast performances that are happening all over the world, right? Classical music and contemporary classical music, live stream and broadcast performances happening all over the world at different times of the day that you can tune into. And one of the things that we we started to hear from our partner organizations is am I suddenly in competition with the New York Phil, for example, someone who is not who is not in my immediate geographic region? And what we wanted to help them understand was, no, you you have built a community, and that community is still turning to you during this time, even when they're able to engage with content from much larger organizations or companies, they will still turn to you because of the special qualities that you present, the programming that you choose, the content that you're delivering, and the care with which you approach your community. I'd like for you to keep this in mind as you're thinking about these things. If I'm suddenly looking at a larger market because of the ability to have a virtual event, I want you to keep dialing back into what makes us special? What do people come to us for? How do I provide that in a virtual and digital environment? Keep thinking about those things as one of your key learnings. One of our other key learnings is educating audiences to have the best experience with you. We are very familiar with this in the arts and cultural landscape of welcoming people into our spaces. Here's where to park. Here's how to check your coat before you sit down. Here's where you go. The restrooms are this way. Feel free to check that out. And then here's like you get a program. You can learn more about the you can learn more about the performance. In the virtual environment, we don't have the ability to walk them through our space, our physical space, but we have the ability to walk them through our virtual space in our digital space. Thinking about that. What is the what is the flow that your audience member experiences from the minute that they find out about the performance to registering for the event or buying a ticket? How do you make sure that they have the information that they want to interact with before they're interacting with the performance itself? Are they able to log in? Have you given them information about what's the best sound settings to experience your performance with? How will they know how to interact with other participants? Is there going to be a live chat during the performance? Does that increase their increase their participation or their increase their positive feelings about being involved with the performance, then make sure that they know about that, right? Do they want to do they want to leave feedback after the performance? Is there a way that they can show their applause in the virtual space? Encourage them to do so and make that feel like we're always looking for ways to make that feel like a more welcoming experience. So uh, one of the things that I want to remind you about for this is reminders, right? <laughs> and making sure that they have a positive experience is because we're no longer traveling necessarily for the virtual concert experience, or during this time, we have not been traveling to get to the virtual concert experience. Reminders are so, so important. You are by and large interacting with your listening audience through the same portal, their computer that they use for work, they use for catching up with other people, they use for a myriad of other things. It's so easy for them to go to that, go to their computer, go to that portal to 
in with their intention to listen to your concert and then get distracted by something else, that it's okay to remind them. So when you're sending those reminder emails, here's your reminder 24 hours ahead of time. Here's your reminder two hours ahead of time. The curtain is rising. Join us now. It's, it's, beneficial to send your community those reminders make them feel like you're you're awaiting their presence in your virtual concert hall one of the things that i would like for you to apply to your upcoming virtual in person and hybrid events is to continue to invest in virtual performances and hybrid events for audience accessibility and audience development so much of what I hear in the classical music sector is, oh, thank God we can go back, right? Oh, thank God it's a return to normal, right? And that, when I hear that, my heart falls a little bit because I I realize that we haven't quite made the realization that this is a way for us to connect with people that we've never been able to do before, which is thinking about audience accessibility. They may not be able to drive to your concert hall. They may have little children at home and they, and not be able to afford childcare to be able to make it to the performance, but you can continue to offer them that ability to engage with art in a way that fits into their lives more. And that's a gift that we have that we should continue to carry forward into the future is thinking about, am I making our art even more accessible, even more inviting, in addition to the in-person experience, can I think about a way that allows more audiences to engage in the work that we're doing? Not less. Not, and speaking of less, virtual, virtual concert hall experiences are not a lesser than option. They are a different than option. And I would love for everyone to take that in and think about what that means. How do I make sure that this is an accessible option, something that's engaging and compelling rather than a knockoff version of our in-person performances. Some of the things that I experienced this year is I engaged with artists who were doing really special ways of, of allowing people to engage with the art as well as something that was at home for them. So I'm thinking about a piano and viola duo that I deeply love who started doing a wine and chocolate pairing where they would mail the wine and chocolates ahead of time. And then they would intro as they were performing they would intro the piece and you could taste and you could taste and drink the things as they were performing and it became this participatory event and it was amazing to see the chat fill up with with comments about the chocolate about the wine and about the music now i had mentioned that i'm a creative placemaking specialist and strategist and something that i deeply love is connecting with other people through through place through our places that we share together. And I want us to remember, as we're thinking about virtual performances, as we're thinking about virtual gatherings, hybrid gatherings, and in-person gatherings, is that you are always creating and reinforcing community in each of those settings, in all of those settings. And if you are unfamiliar with this term, placemaking and creative placemaking more specifically is about using arts and cultural strategies to implement community-led change. Creative placemaking has the potential to do more than just embellish a location. It identifies, it elevates, it assembles a collection of qualities that imbue a location with meaning and significance. I'm going to say that part again, which is a collection of qualities that imbue a location with meaning and significance. As I encourage you to think about your virtual spaces in addition to your in-person spaces today, I want you to think about what is the collection of qualities that imbues this virtual space with meaning and significance? How are we coming together to use, to use arts and cultural strategies to implement change? If you are an organization, if you're a company and you're thinking about thinking about your virtual events, I want you to ask yourself, what are our organizational values and what is your vision? Now, with that in mind, I'm going to think through what is the fullest expression of that in the digital or virtual space? Are we building community? Are we inviting people into art experiences? Are we 
educating people about the long tradition of music, whatever it is that your values are, whatever it is that your vision is, you can make that happen in a virtual space as well as in person. Another aspect of creative placemaking is identifying strategic partners. So one of the things that I love about coming to Eventicon is connecting with other people, right? While we're all working in different sectors, we're all attempting to make change in the ways that we want to, we're all attempting to have an impact on the world, is looking around and saying, who are the who are my potential strategic partners? What do we value together? How can we how can we team up to see that happen? So what kind of change are you looking to make in your sector? And can you team up with artists, musicians, m- dancers, etc., cetera, to, to help lead the way, to help cr- show the path, for example? One of those things that I participated in this year was Houston Grand Opera's um, outreach part of their organization had an amazing series that they did in conjunction with a with the uh regional hospital um, system. And so they partnered to to use to use art artistic practices to talk about public health issues. So I encourage you to think broader than just, oh, artists with artists or tech with tech. I really want you to think about how can we cross sector partner and work together to see the change that we want. With those things in mind, As I mentioned, I'm the incoming executive director for a live music project. I would really love for you to come see what we're up to, especially check out our concert calendar if you're wanting to experience classical music in the virtual or in person. And and just drop me a note sometime. I'm Megan at livemusicproject.org. You can drop me an email there. And I would love to continue this conversation if any of these themes are, are up your alley. So thank you so much, Eventicon, for having me. I love that this was a part of the the programming. It's so important. And I think it's something that everybody does so much. So to have, again, that virtual um, possibility and to see the arts virtually and bring it to life or bring it home, I think is so important uh, for everybody. So thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm.